Today, we're going to bust some caffeine myths. Now, recently, a company called Light Tales made a relatively inexpensive caffeine analyzer, and so immediately I had to buy it. It's in here. Now, I say relatively because it was still around two and a half thousand dollars, but that's cheaper than anything else I've seen. Now, the reason I was so interested to get it is because there's been loads of studies on caffeine, but honestly, most of the time I haven't really trusted either the quality of coffee they were brewing or the quality of brewing that they were measuring. And suddenly, I could do a bunch of tests and ask a bunch of questions and get a bunch of real answers that are relevant to me and the coffee that I drink and the coffee that you drink at home or in cafes every day. First of all, I'll show you how this machine works because it is kind of interesting. And then we'll get into the really fascinating stuff. We're going to cover things from instant coffee to espresso brewing to roast levels. And there are some surprises in this whole thing. This is it. I know it doesn't look like two and a half thousand dollars. It doesn't look very exciting, but I promise you it is. The way it works is kind of annoying. If we're honest, turn it on. That bit's fine. And I'll connect to it with my phone in a second. But we need to talk about how you actually do a single caffeine test. And there, there's some bad news. Each test requires this pack of reagent and stuff. There's a chip, there's some pipettes, and there's some reagent in there. Let me show you. There's a little chip. The chip is what you insert into the machine. All of this is single usage. You can't reuse a chip. You can't reuse a reagent. And so each test, each single test requires this kit. And this kit costs seven pounds 50 per test, which is wasteful and expensive. So I had to make sure to make every test count, which we did. So these two are connected and I can begin my test. I'm going to need to get a sample of coffee. I happen to have some coffee just here. These are kind of cool. These are pipettes that allow you to kind of capture a very fixed, consistent amount of liquid. That full kind of straw section is what you'll always get. So, and so we've got a full little tube of coffee there. That gets mixed with this here reagent. And go, in it goes. Give it a shake for 10 seconds. And then we just need to cover the sort of reading area of the chip with coffee. I can hit start and the analysis can begin. And we've got a result. We're going to talk about caffeine levels in a couple of different ways. We'll talk about the total amount of caffeine in a drink. And we'll also talk about the kind of caffeine level per 100 milliliters or deciliter. It's kind of how the little machine works. Bear in mind that the daily recommended allowance of caffeine for most people is up to 300 milligrams. I did make a whole video about caffeine. I'll link it in the description down below. But let's move on with that first test. So the first test we wanted to do was filter coffee versus espresso. Was there a difference in how much caffeine you get based on how you make your coffee? If you took 18 grams of coffee and you brewed it as an espresso to say 36 grams of liquid, but you extracted a kind of fixed amount of coffee that way, let's say 21% of the ground coffee was extracted into the beverage. And then you made a filter coffee with 18 grams of coffee, same coffee again, but here you used 300 mils of water uh, to extract 21%, let's say. If you compared those two identical extractions, was there a difference in caffeine? Turns out, oh wow, there really, really is. The average espresso in testing, the whole espresso, if you drank that whole double, had 110 milligrams of caffeine. If you drank that whole filter coffee, again, from exactly the same amount of, of ground coffee at the start, but if you drank that whole beverage, 170 milligrams of caffeine. That is nearly 50% more caffeine in the filter coffee than the espresso. This absolutely blew my mind. This was astonishing to me because the extraction was the same. I could imagine a little difference, but a difference this big, I could not get my head around. This needed further testing to try and understand what exactly was going on here. This led us to the second kind of group of experiments. Here, what we wanted to do was track what was happening with both coffee extraction and caffeine extraction during the course of the brew for both filter coffee and for espresso. Now, the way you do this is relatively simple. You would make a coffee as normal. Let's say you make a pour over, but underneath it, you're going to catch that resulting liquid in five different bowls, right? So you catch, say, 50 mils in the first bowl, 50 mils in the second bowl, 50 mils in the third, and so on and so on. And so you can kind of slice out the brew into five parts. And you can do exactly the same thing with espresso. So you catch the first, let's say, 10 mils in one cup, the next 10 mils in another, the next 10 mils in another, and you can kind of split it out. Now, you have to know how much your bowls weigh, and you can calculate then the mass of liquid exactly inside. You can then measure the concentration of both solubles and caffeine, and you can build a kind of cumulative chart, what's happening over time, which is what I'm going to show you now. And we'll start with filter coffee 
because I think that's that's a nice place to start here. And so the first chart that I'm going to show you, along the horizontal x-axis, it has mass. And along the vertical y-axis, you would see extraction. Now, what you're seeing here is at the start, the extraction increases very rapidly. And if you look at the color of the liquid coming out of the bottom of your filter cone, it is much darker. There's lots more solubles coming out at that point. And you'll see as we progress the brew and more water passes through the coffee, that rate of extraction starts to slow down and kind of flatten out. You know, the coffee coming through the cone right at the end looks much, much, much paler. Let's look at exactly the same chart, but instead of total solubles, let's just look at caffeine. And again, uh, mass along the x-axis, total caffeine on the vertical y. And it looks very similar. At the start, it extracts really pretty quickly. And again, as we start to run out of caffeine in the ground coffee, that rate slows. And so what you can then do, if you want to, it's a bit nerdy, I know, is you can then chart solubles extraction against caffeine extraction. And here you'll see that there's a pretty linear relationship. The more sort of coffee you extract from the grounds, the more caffeine you get with it. Pretty simple, but let's look at espresso because that I think is where we see some changes. So here, again, same first chart, right? Along the bottom, we've got mass. Along the y-axis, we've got kind of uh, total extraction. And again, espresso extracts very quickly at the start. That first liquid out is dense and gooey and delicious, and it gets thinner and kind of waterier as you go. So the same thing happens. But if you look at the caffeine versus mass sort of chart here, you'll see that it kind of starts to look a little different. The caffeine seems to lag a little bit behind the sort of total extraction. And so when you chart out caffeine extraction and coffee extraction, you see quite clearly there's a big lag in caffeine extraction in the early phases, and then it picks up speed. Hi there. I just wanted to interrupt because I forgot to say this in the video. If you pull more like a longer, like a three to one ratio, a longer espresso, do expect more caffeine for the same overall kind of extraction. You'll see from this chart that again, caffeine is accelerating towards the end. And so longer espressos do have more caffeine. Not as much as a pour over, but definitely more. Okay, thanks, bye. Now, this particular shot was with a niche grinder. I'll show you a different chart now. This one from the Optiono, the P100, so a bigger bird grinder. And here, this kind of caffeine lag is way more obvious, which I think is really, really interesting, though. That grinder extracts very, very quickly right at the start, too. So it feels like some aspect of caffeine extraction is linked to contact time. That's the only thing I could think of as the kind of variable between these two things. Is it that just espresso happens so quickly that there's not enough contact time to get the caffeine out, even though there is enough contact time to get all those good, delicious, soluble materials out? That led to the next experiment. For this one, we required the use of the trusty AeroPress. Uh, and the experiment here was going to be pretty simple. We were going to take a traditional AeroPress recipe, 12 grams to 200 grams of water. And what we were going to change for a fixed grind setting was just the contact time, the kind of steep time initially before the swirl, the settle, and the press. And we did a bunch of different tests here, going from a 30 second steep to a 20 minute steep. Broadly, what you'd expect to see happen with extraction happened. The longer your contact time went on, the more you extracted. This is news, I feel, to almost nobody, right? We know that the longer something steeps in water, the more stuff comes out of it. However, the caffeine extraction rate very quickly started to flatline. In fact, once you'd brewed and steeped for two minutes in that particular phase, you didn't see any additional caffeine extraction really happening, regardless of how long you steeped for. And so you don't have to worry that having a really long steep time, which can taste really good in, say, an AeroPress or even a French press, that's not giving you more caffeine than you otherwise would have. It's seemingly having little to no impact on the caffeine, obviously, once you cross that threshold of steep time where you're getting what you need out. I don't understand this. And I feel like this is one particular area that needs loads more testing. But there's a lot more to talk about. So we need to talk about instant coffee. And this is one area, this is the area where I've made the biggest mistake and essentially spread the most misinformation by mistake. Now, I'll give you an anecdote that I've heard quite often. People often said to me, I used to drink instant and now I drink specialty, I drink fresh coffee, and I feel like there's way more caffeine in that. And I would typically reply, that seems surprising because instant coffee, pretty much everywhere, is mostly made with Robusta as a species, which has twice the caffeine content of Arabica. And I was also pretty confident that sort of during the extraction process, 
that would have gotten all of the caffeine out of the Robusta. And so my theory had been, my presumption had been, there was more caffeine in instant coffee than there would have been in fresh coffee because fresh coffee was made of better quality coffee that started with less caffeine in there. Then I did some testing and it did not go the way I thought it would. Instant coffee compared to a pour over has way, way less caffeine in it. This is a slightly tricky thing to say because obviously the way that you make instant coffee will have a big impact on, on sort of how much caffeine is in there, right? Now, if you get a jar of Nescafe Gold, you don't have to, but if you did, it will tell you on the side to take 1.8 grams of instant and mix that into 200 mils of hot water. They are proposing you a, a cup of coffee that is incredibly weak, actually, a 0.9% strength compared to a typical filter coffee that would be, say, 1.3 to 1.6, somewhere in that range. So they're saying, brew it weak. And, you know, maybe for good reason. What we wanted to do was actually have Instant be a comparable strength to filter coffee to compare those two things. So we then took three grams of Instant uh, for 200 mils of water, which then gave us a 1.5% strength beverage at the end of it. So how much caffeine are we talking about? Now here, rather than talk about total beverage amounts here, we're going to talk about caffeine concentrations per 100 mils per deciliter. Instant coffee made the way they tell you to had just under 40 milligrams of caffeine per deciliter. If you made it the way that, you know, we might to get the matching strength, that would go up to 60 milligrams per deciliter, roughly speaking. A lot of the pour overs that we measured were actually more like 80 milligrams per deciliter. That means if you made two matching size cups of, you know, industry standard instant versus industry standard pour over, you might have twice the caffeine per serving in the specialty coffee. This to me was shocking. It was astonishing. And what I had massively underestimated and kind of forgotten about was just how much of those grounds instant coffee manufacturers are extracting. We tend to see a ceiling of about 30% being the maximum. Instant coffee manufacturers are able to go higher through a number of processes. They're just using way, way, way less coffee beans per cup of coffee, and then getting you to make it pretty weak. Now we did go out and test the cheapest, strongest, harshest instant we could find, presuming that to be the purest kind of robusta and therefore probably the highest caffeine. That was higher, but again, at industry standard 0.9% strength, that was still only 55 milligrams of caffeine per deciliter. So still not near the caffeine strength of good specialty coffee. This has definitely been misinformation I've spread. I apologize for this now. I did not realize how wrong I was, but if you have a friend or colleague that seems to get through like five cups of instant coffee a day and be fine, well, this is why. It just doesn't have that much caffeine in it compared to good fresh coffee. As a side note, uh, we did uh, at one point measure the concentration uh, of a uh, V60 brewed with Lavazza, which is obviously some robusta in that. It's still fresh coffee. How was the caffeine concentration there? Yeah, it was over 100 milligrams uh, per deciliter. So, so you know, again, cheaper raw materials, and Lavazza Rosso does have some Robusta in it, will have more caffeine in them. So specialty is, is less caffeine than cheaper fresh coffee, but it's still more than instant. The last test that I wanted to do for this video was one that I get asked about a lot. I was asked about it in the recent video I did with Wired on their channel for doing kind of coffee support. And that is, is it true that there is less caffeine in darker roasted coffee? It's a question you get asked a lot. The reason people ask it is the fact that caffeine sublimates, which means it goes from being a solid to a gas, at temperatures achieved in the upper ends of kind of roasting temperatures. The idea is that as you roast a coffee dark, you're kind of driving caffeine out of the bean. It's sublimating out, so dark roasts have less caffeine in them. I was always highly skeptical of this, uh, but I wanted to test it. And so we took a coffee, one particular coffee, we did a sample roast of it to a kind of slightly underdeveloped, under roasted way, a kind of normal roast, and then a dark roast into what's called second crack, which is a sort of stage in roasting that would be uh, a measurement point for kind of darker roasts. You could go much darker than this, but I didn't really want to. Then we would take each of those three samples and brew them as a pour over to matching sort of extraction levels. Then we'd compare the caffeine and the results were super, super interesting. Turns out the dark roast filter brew had the highest concentration of caffeine. And it was a pretty big difference. So the dark roast brew for matching extraction in terms of total solubles was 72 milligrams of caffeine per deciliter. 
The medium roast, the kind of traditional normal roast, had about 67.5 milligrams of caffeine in it, and the very light, slightly underdeveloped roast had 62 milligrams per deciliter of caffeine in it. So that's a pretty large swing there. Now, I think there's two reasons for this. Firstly, the longer you roast coffee, the less dense it gets, right? Like that, that 10 kilos of coffee you might load into a commercial roaster, what you're getting out at the end of it is going down the longer you roast. So a light roast, you might end up with only eight and a half kilos. With a really dark roast, you may only end up with say eight kilos of coffee. Now, a lot of what goes away is moisture, but other stuff does essentially degrade and disappear out during the roasting process. This means that to make up say 10 grams of coffee, you would need more dark roasted coffee beans. But this doesn't explain everything. Because actually, if you count how many dark roasted coffee beans we needed for 10 grams versus the, the medium roast versus the light, well, medium to dark, you needed about 7% on average more coffee beans to make up 10 grams of coffee. But we were seeing an increase in caffeine of around 8.5%. So it wasn't just that you needed more beans. That darker roasted coffee is more porous, it's less dense, and I think part of that means it's even easier to extract every scrap of caffeine that's in there. Conversely, that drop in caffeine that we saw with the under-roasted coffee meant that it might just be harder to get the caffeine out from a much denser, less roasted coffee bean, as well as you just need less beans to make up your dose of coffee that you're going to start with. This I thought was super interesting, uh, and it kind of goes with my own experience and my own kind of theories coming into this. So I was kind of pleased to be proved right, but I, I definitely didn't expect the swing that we saw from light to medium to dark in terms of total concentration. A highlight of the video for me, a highlight of the testing. Now, one thing I do want to acknowledge at this point is that you'll see different numbers at different times for kind of the same brew method, right? You'll see a pour over that seems to yield 65 or 70 milligrams in one case, and a pour over same recipe that yields say 80 milligrams per deciliter in another place. Different coffees do have different caffeine levels in them, uh, and that definitely showed up in our testing. What we would definitely do when we were testing something was use the same coffee for, say, espresso and filter, or the same coffee for all of the tests to try and isolate that variable. But coffee itself is a variable. Generally, when we, you know, saw sort of Ethiopian coffees used, they seem to have fractionally less caffeine than other coffees we used. We didn't see a massive variance amongst kind of high quality, high grown specialty coffees, but we did see some variance. And the amount of testing we would need to do to, to kind of give you guidance there is enormous. It's, it's on the list, but it's enormous. Generally speaking, I think we know that you know, caffeine is the plant's response to insects and that the higher you grow coffee, the less caffeine the plant tends to produce. I think that's a good, very broad rule of thumb that will absolutely have exceptions to it, but it, it's a good place to kind of start. But yeah, know that some of the variance you'll see in those final numbers is down to the fact that the coffee used was different because we wanted to test lots of coffee, lots of grinders, lots of brewers, all of that kind of stuff to get to useful actionable insights about how you're going to brew and drink and enjoy coffee day to day. Now, I know there's other tests you'd probably like me to do, and I want to hear about them down in the comments below. What should I have tested? What's left out there that you really want to know? I'd love to hear your thoughts and your ideas. And even if you don't have an idea, let me know which of these tests was the most interesting or relevant to you, which was the biggest surprise. I have really enjoyed this video. This has been a massive learning experience for me. Uh, I've definitely been humbled by it. I've been inspired by it. It's been a ton of fun, and I hope it is very useful and interesting to you. But for now, I will say thank you so much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.